Kelly Moore Capito needs to uh, get on to another meeting around 8.20. So her time is short with us. Let's bring her in and say good morning uh, to Senator Capito. Great to have you with us. Good morning. Always good to be on. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. I'm in Charleston. It's a beautiful day here. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful to hear. I know you were in the Eastern Panhandle recently, correct? I was. I was. I had a great time. On Thursday, I went to uh, Eagle School L uh, Intermediate, and I do this program. I think I've talked about it on your show where I get the girls together, the fifth grade girls together, and basically uh, talk with them about their futures and that they can be and, and do anything they want. And I call it my West Virginia Girls Rise Up. It's a beautiful school out there and a really, really interesting uh aspirations of the of the girls a vets a chef a paleontologist a pediatric uh, doctor all kinds of things nail technician you got it and uh so we had we had a good time it was about 100 girls and uh, i appreciate the welcome i got from the administrators the teachers and uh, the school board came out and so it was fun met the superintendent are you a, a person who impresses young ladies when they meet you, or are they at the age where you're just like, hey, Senator, I don't even know what that means? You know what? That's interesting because I, I chose fifth grade because when, when girls traditionally, when they get to middle school, they just won't talk. But in fifth grade, they still will. And, and so I try to tell them, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, your government, and I try to sort of demystify all of that, run for office, but I also talk about, all kinds of different ways to be a leader. And I just want to see our girls, particularly those that maybe not be exposed to different types of uh, leadership skills and what it takes to be a leader. Uh, so I don't think I intimidate them, maybe a little bit in the in the beginning, and by the end we're just yelling our lungs out, West Virginia girls rise up. So it's a lot like this show then. Bill comes in, <laughs> initially we're all respectful because he's an admiral, and then it just and deteriorates. Then, and then John comes in. <laughs> and then at the end of the show, you're just yelling your lungs. That's the way it works. Now, she, uh, con uh, Senator, you were also at the the Inwood new facility, water facility right. there as well. So. Right. Well, we yeah. went out to see uh, the, the water board there. We went out to uh, Bunker Hill, new water treatment plant, massive $79 million investment uh, to bring more and cleaner and, well, keep everything modern, but also to be able to expand it with that growing area there, have much more uh, ability to serve more uh, customers um uh you know it's a it's a uh, a team effort between what we can do at the federal level uh berkeley water water development authority west virginia drinking water uh and so yeah we were out there uh and then i stopped by the morgan cabin on my way out of town and i'd never been there before so that's sort of an interesting little historic stop because we're planning for the future with more water and then we're looking at the past with the 1731 cabin out there. And it's basically the same way it was the day it was built. It's uh, wonderfully I, preserved. You know, do you ever wonder things like, how did they get all the way? I mean, why yeah. here? You know, yeah. why in this exact spot? Yeah. <laughs> That's now, what I always wonder. Like, did your horse get tired? You just went, <laughs> okay, we're down. Yep. There uh, was... So, there's a series yeah. of fort. There's a series of forts along that line from Winchester up toward the Potomac River, and the uh, uh, Morgan cabin was very close to one of those forts. So, so I knew you'd know the answer to that question. Well, he fought in that battle, Senator Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh memories. From it. Yeah, memories like that don't go away. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, an opportunity for uh, some peace accords here in the Middle East, uh, maybe a ceasefire of some sort or uh, even a solution to this conflict with the uh, assassination of the head of Hamas, Senator Capito. Will we be able to get any progress moving in that direction? Well, I did notice where our secretary of state is going back over there. Uh, I think that uh, uh, getting uh, uh, Sinwar and eliminating him as the head of Hamas is very significant. I think it's got to be in terms of their movement and also for the uh, the Israeli Defense Forces. And so I think a ceasefire release the remaining hostages, tell us the status of those that we know are no longer alive. We know there are some in that category, unfortunately, and, and let's get to a ceasefire before we have more destruction. But I do believe Israel, has, and I've said this before on the show, Israel has the right to eliminate the terrorists right on their border, and that's what they're doing. Well, you know, nobody wants to see innocent people killed in war, 
that is an unfortunate byproduct of war. But when a terrorist enemy is hiding among the people, I'm not sure how many choices you have in the matter. Exactly. I mean, I think that's why I've, I've said that Israel needs to, if they just leave it half done or uh, still the leaders uh, in place, you know, they have this written into their, you know, uh, mantras that they that they repeat or it's part of a religion is to destroy Israel and the Jews. And so we can't allow that to happen and they can't allow that to happen. So I, I think that as difficult as it has been, I think that uh, Israelis have the right to defend themselves, and that's what they're doing. Mr. Gilstrap. Good morning, Senator. Uh, hey. I, I want to switch over to domestic politics here for a second. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. If, President, if, if President Trump re-wins the White House and mm-hmm. he doesn't win one or more of uh, uh, the legislature, uh, legislative uh, bodies, the Senate or the, or the House, is there a chance he can get anything done? I have a the things I write take me to a lot of conspiracy sites and, and the overarching theories are this, that if he wins and the Senate does not go to the Republicans, that the Senate will call him an insurrectionist and not certify the vote on January 6th. If he wins the presidency and the Democrats keep the House, then there'll be an instant impeachment process and tie up the, the government either way. Does do either of those scenarios resonate? Well, I do think uh, in divided government, John, sometimes more things get done uh, because uh, that's the only way to get them done is to reach some sort of uh, some sort of consensus. I do I do want to be on the record, of course, as advocating, as you would know, a uh, Republican House and Senate to go with President Trump's presidency. I think that obviously we would be able to work on fiscal policies that we'd put forward before. You know, all these conspiracy. I I, I don't know. You know, we're going to have a good and safe and accurate election in 2024, and I think we need to – that's the that's the dialogue I think that we need to continue with for all sides because uh, no matter who wins, and I do believe today that President Trump wins, and uh, we have to you know have faith in our elections. Um, I, I don't know. I do have a question about the House, though. I do think because impeachment is, has been – uh, such an everyday thing now, uh, you know, two impeachments for um, uh, President Trump, rumors through the last four administration or four years that impeachment of uh, Biden or parts of his administration, it's become more of a, uh, a normalized thing, whereas I think originally not so much at all. And so I do worry about a house uh, filled with, with uh, folks who absolutely cannot stand Donald Trump, and and their bluntest instrument is the instrument of impeachment. So um, hopefully we don't go down that road. It's destructive, I think, in a lot of ways, and uh, but I wouldn't be surprised. Senator, we have a massive turnout and uh, uh, early voting in both Georgia and Michigan. Uh, this is a good sign, I think, is it not? I, I, you know what? I think it's a great sign. I think uh, part of what we saw in 2020 was a depression of the vote, the early vote and the uh, vote uh, absentee vote. And I think we should encourage everybody to vote and and get them out as early and as conveniently as possible. So I'm going to I'm going to side with the um, the thought that an early vote is a good vote. I think the ground games that are organized, I was just in Michigan with Mike Rogers running for Senate and I'm going to be in Ohio tomorrow or today, actually. And um, the the. The, the Republican get out the vote mechanisms are very strong in these states. And so I think early voting, I, I had a constituent or somebody in Michigan came up to me, should I early vote? I said, yes, because you don't know what's going to happen on election day. Go ahead and vote. Get your vote in. And uh, that's sort of the attitude I have. Uh, and, and I encourage people in West Virginia to vote early, too. I think it opens up uh, maybe at the end of this week or the beginning of next. Looking at some numbers, I'm uh, uh the Republicans are turning out early voting much more than they have in recent past. Yeah, I think I think that uh, I think honestly that President Trump in Georgia, in particular, discouraged early voting and discouraged uh, absentee voting, and I think in the end it cost us some Senate seats because uh, it just depressed the numbers that we knew 
uh, in Georgia, which is becoming more purple, but essentially still is a red state. So I think, you know, uh, it, it became very apparent over the last three years that having an organized effort to get people out early and out voting is, is a way to success. Thank you. For and bring- you could see that in Pennsylvania, too, because. The Pennsylvania early vote came out really strong for Fetterman. The vote on that day, uh, on on election day, um, I think uh, for Pennsylvania was stronger for Dr. Oz, but it wasn't enough to overcome. Thank you for bringing up that Georgia point. I've been saying that about President Trump for four years, just about. I thought his words really cost the Republicans the Senate. He discouraged people from voting in Georgia. He said it wouldn't matter. Yeah, I mean, I think there were a lot, there were a lot of factors going on at the time, uh, but I do think discouraging any, anybody to vote that can do it the most conveniently is not a good strategy. So make sure you get your votes out. That's the, that's the key. Get your votes out. About a minute left in regards to the uh, federal government and continuing resolutions and the operation of the government. What are you hearing? Because there's another deadline coming up. Well, I think one of the things we're hearing, obviously, is the need for some more disaster relief for our friends in North Carolina and uh, in through the Georgia areas and in Florida. So I think disaster relief is always something that has to be timely and quick. So I think we'll go to that first. Uh, And then I think we're going to have the challenge of a dysfunctional system. I'm on appropriations. We've had our appropriations bill finished. Chuck Schumer has not put them up on the Senate floor. And so we're behind. And so hopefully we're, you know, here we are going to have to cram a bunch of of work in before we uh, before we leave in December, uh, I, I'm actually planning a Christmas Eve service at the United States Senate floor. Mm. <laughs> I'm inviting my family to come open their gifts in the uh, in the U.S. Capitol. I'm kidding about that, but I think we're going to run right up to Christmas and maybe after trying to figure this out. A lot's going to depend on who wins. Thank you so much for your time this morning. We always appreciate it. All right, you guys have a good day. It's beautiful out there. You Bye-bye. too. Thank you, Senator. Take care.